want to continue talking to you about the presence of Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. This is part two, practicing his presence. And the reason practicing is because his presence comes into our life as we learn obedience in our life. Amen. As we learn to walk with him and talk with him, as we learn to put him above all other things in our life. How many of you know it's easy to say that you're putting him above all other things, but a whole other thing to live that out in reality. Amen? Yeah. One amen on that, but y'all know it's true. <clears throat> his presence is what we need. It's what we need in our church. It's what we need in our life. It's what we need in our families. It's what we need in our homes. Nothing substitutes for the presence of precious Holy Spirit. Amen? His divine gifts, His divine revelation, His divine wisdom. We need Him. Not just knowledge of Him, not just religious talk and songs about Him. We need Him. And then you have to ask yourself, why are there so many believers who are afraid, fearful of the Holy Spirit? Downright scared. We had somebody used to come to our church, start talking about the Holy Spirit, off they went. I'll tell you why. It's because when Holy Spirit gets involved in our life, the gospel becomes real. It's no longer a religion of convenience, but it becomes reality. Amen? When you get up off the floor and you're praying in a whole other language that God just supernaturally gave you, what are you going to say, Lord? <laughs> this is a lot different from the religion I grew up with. We just heard about stuff that Jesus did. We didn't know Jesus did any stuff anymore. Jesus is still doing stuff. And he wants to do more stuff in us and through us if we would learn to practice his presence. Shared with the Sunday school class, went to uh, my Wednesday afternoon prayer time with some other ministers here in town been a part of that group for i don't know since we started with one other pastor there's two of us there who started it and it just continued so now like five six years later however many years but we were there and there was a a visitor there from kansas a young fella in his 30s and he leads a prayer ministry he is a man of prayer i'm talking about praying hours and hours and hours every day, leading people in prayer, teaching people to pray, praying with people. That's what he does. And he had the gift of prophecy on him. And he went one by one, as well as the lady who was there, but he was really, in my mind, he was really, really impressive. And he prophesied over one pastor that the issues that that pastor had been having, legal issues with his church and with some other entities here in town, they've been dealing with this stuff for months, would be resolved by seven the next morning before the cock crowed three times. And at seven that night, that pastor put on our little group messaging forum that his attorney had called him and they had come up with a satisfactory legal thing that stopped all the lawsuit from happening and all the other issues they were dealing with. So they came to a settlement. They came to an agreement. That was at 7 that night. Now, he'd been dealing with this for months. This young man didn't know it, but Holy Spirit knew it. And I'm not boasting on the young man other than to say I'm boasting on the Holy Spirit in the young man. Because the words of prophecy, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, when they're actively working, it's not us, it's him. It's us yielding to him, to be used of him, to minister grace and peace and encouragement in life to other people. And your pastor received a word, and it was an accurate word. I mean, and I know it was straight from the Holy Spirit. Some of you are curious what it is, right? I told him in Sunday school, he said, if you came to Sunday school, you'd know. <laughs> no, I'll tell you all, because I'm not going to be mean. So he, <laughs> true statement though. So he told me from the Holy Spirit that God had placed a special anointing 
to teach and to lead people into holiness in a way that was unique and in a way that would attract young couples and young people and that even the ministers there needed to understand, well, he didn't know about my Jewish background. I wasn't dressed like a Jewish rabbi. I was just me. He didn't know anything about my life. But the Holy Spirit knows and knows my heart is to bring these pastors and these ministers and these churches to learn to celebrate God's appointed time through the feast to celebrate Jesus, amen, to celebrate Yeshua, Messiah, through God's holidays, more so than even the holidays we normally celebrate. And I believe that Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit smiles on that. But you see, Holy Spirit knew that. And so I say all that to say that the presence of the Holy Spirit is there, and he wants to be in our life just as real and just as present. There are people who will travel thousands of miles to get into the presence of the Holy Spirit because of some special speaker. Did you know that? But did you know that the Holy Spirit's right here in you and with you? And the presence you're seeking is not found on man. It is found in him. And he's available all the time. Let's pray. That was all free. Father, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for your presence, precious Holy Spirit. You are welcome in this place. Even though we know that you are in us, Lord, and upon us, we know that there is a special anointing presence when we come together and exalt and uplift the name of Jesus. And we give you glory and honor this day. Speak through me to these, your people. May something said, something spoken, something done make an impact in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. What does it mean for us to practice his presence in our life? And I want to start, this is part two, where we left off two weeks ago. This is Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What are we willing to give for his presence and for the real in our life? How many of you know there's counterfeit out there? But how many of you know a counterfeit $100 bill doesn't negate a real $100 bill? And how many of you know you're a lot happier with a real $100 bill than a fake $100 bill? How many of you have ever worked like a flea market or something like that or a store or retail outlet where you had one of those pens? I called it the pen of discernment. And you had to mark through that $100 bill to see if it was real or not, right? And if you marked through, if it was real, it would tell you it's real. And so it was your pen of discernment. We need the presence of precious Holy Spirit and his pen of discernment in our life to let us know what's really real and what's really fake. There are some Christians that get, they see so much fake, they dis, get discouraged and they forget there is a real. Everybody say, there is a real. I'm talking about the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit to transform and change lives is real. <clears throat> I'll never forget at our first church, I was just a kid, I was 23 years old at this time, and we had a special speaker from Nigeria. And I still remember his name, which is weird, because how many of you know I don't normally remember names? But it's like, once I remember your name, I won't forget it. His name was Emmanuel Omabajesu. <laughs> Try remembering that for 40 years, brother. And Emmanuel Omabajesu was a Nigerian pastor. And he'd come to America, and we were a tiny little church, our church was, the whole building was maybe the size of this piece of the sanctuary right here. And we were packed out that evening, I think it was evening service, and uh, Emmanuel was speaking, and he had warned us that a lot of times when he speaks, in Nigeria, demons manifest themselves. Well, how many of you know, in America, people aren't used to dealing with demons, and the greatest backdoor revival we ever had was when he spoke. Because he spoke, and a young man in the front row, P, 
picked up a chair, picked up a chair over his head, and went to kill the Nigerian preacher. Swung those over his head. <clears throat> there was no soldiers for Jesus on the front row except for me. And he swung those over his head, and I jumped to my feet. I put my hand just above the leg, so if he went to swing, it wouldn't go anywhere. But just, I mean, all this took place in a heartbeat. But Emmanuel is used to dealing with demonic entities, and he is a man full of wisdom and full of the power of the Holy Spirit. He looked and he said, Devil, in the name of Jesus, I command you, fall back. And when he did, that young man flew backwards. The chair went tumbling, and he was... And then he went and proceeded to cast demons out of that man. Many of the couples in the church, small little church, freaked them out, scared them to death, never came back. <clears throat> Just being honest with you. You see, we want to hear about the stuff, but we don't want to do the stuff or see the stuff. Because when the stuff starts happening, it becomes real. It becomes really real. And for some people, it becomes too real. They don't want to deal with the reality of Jesus being who he says he is because that makes their life have to be accountable to God. And if people don't choose and don't want to be accountable to God, they want the gospel of convenience. What's convenient for the day and convenient for me? What's convenient for you? And don't say that in true. That's how we in America live. It's the few and the rare in between who don't live like that. We make this about us. So, what are we willing to give for his presence and for the real in our life? I want the real. Guys, I've seen things in my walk with Jesus that would blow your minds. I still see things that blow my mind at the reality of who God really is. And there's a hunger in my heart, not for signs and wonders per se, but for His presence. And with His presence, the signs and wonders come. And His presence comes... when we spend time with him. And you know, it's funny, it's not even hard. It's hard on your flesh, but it's not hard to do. How hard is it to crack open your Bible and read a little bit every day? And how hard is it to talk to the Heavenly Father as your best friend? I mean, really, how hard is it? It's not hard. He's not asking you to crawl on your knees on broken glass. He's asking you to spend some time with him. And you spend some time with him, and then his presence comes as a result of that automatically. Have you ever met somebody that spends time with the Lord? Many of you spend time with the Lord. You meet somebody that spends time with the Lord, there's something unique about them. They're different. There's a shine, there's a glow, there's a joy, there's a peace. There's some life. Everybody say life. Dakota, I'm stuck. If you could click me, please. Thank you. His presence is transformational and life-changing. You see, there's a lot, and this is one of my things on here you'll see that I wrote down, but there's a lot in America that we call the presence of the Lord that isn't the presence of the Lord. How do we discern the two? His presence can make you emotional. I'm not saying it can't, but emotion by itself is not an indication of God's presence. The indication of God's presence is a transformed life with weeping, without weeping. Right? I've seen people weep, get up the same, and there's no transformation in their life. But they sure left a wet mark on the carpet. I'm just being honest. I've seen people not weep like robots. And yet their life is changed and transformed. So the presence of the Lord cannot be judged by an emotional response 
but can only be discerned and be judged by transformed lives and transformed hearts. You cannot experience his presence and not be changed. I'll tell you that. Amen? Now, sometimes that change does result in some emotional upheaval. And that's okay. Amen? But if it doesn't, that's okay too. As long as your life is being changed, it's okay. Someone say amen. Dakota. Why does it keep not why does it keep sticking? Go find your mom and find out for me. How many believers don't even know what is being talked about when we talked about his presence? You talk to some believers about the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and they're like, Well, that's weird. I talk to him, but he doesn't talk to me. He talks to us all the time. We just need to hear. We just need to listen. So when we talk about his presence, many believers don't even understand what we even mean by his presence. What do you mean his presence? What do you mean his presence? So what is his presence? His presence sometimes can be physically felt. Do you know that? I can't describe it to you other than sometimes for me, the first time I experienced the real presence of Holy Spirit was the day I got saved. That evening, on my knees as I confessed Jesus as Lord and made him Lord of my life, it felt like warm liquid oil from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. But you know what? That's not every time I get in his presence it feels like that. That was a unique thing. Sometimes his presence is by faith. It's, Lord, I don't feel you, but I know you're there, and I'm going to pray until you respond And then you pray and pray and then you pray through and all of a sudden there's his presence. Amen. There's his presence. I love that story of Nate praying and asking the Holy Spirit, asking Jesus, baptizing the Holy Spirit. He'd been praying, praying, praying. Nothing had happened. Got on his knees, said, Lord, I'm not getting up. Not getting up till I receive it. And he got his prayer language. A few minutes later. So in our life, his presence brings encouragement and brings change. If believers aren't changed, it's because they're not in his presence. You can't find one instance of somebody being in the presence of God who wasn't changed in some way. His presence will do one of two things. He'll either draw you closer to the Lord or draw you further away. Look at Judas. He was in the presence of Jesus all the time. And yet he hardened his heart and it drove him further and further away. See, the teaching, the preaching of God's word and the preaching and teaching of God's truth is going to either bring you closer to the Lord or else you're going to harden your heart. But there will be no middle ground. Because in Jesus, there is no middle ground. There is no lukewarm. There is no half in the world and half in his kingdom. Do you know that? If you're half in the world and half in his kingdom, Jesus says you're all the way in the world. There is no halfway. That is a myth. Someone say a myth. What does our sacrifice look like in comparison to the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus made for us in leaving his throne in glory to purchase you? A man went, he found a Great pearl, a beautiful pearl. Now I have a strange question for you. Have you ever bought an oyster to look for a pearl in it? I have. It was at one of these fairs or one of these somethings. They had oysters there. And they said, you might get a pearl. And I went and I opened it up and there was a pearl inside. Now, it didn't mean it was a pearl of great price because pearls are worth different values depending on how clear they are, blah, blah, blah. But this pearl that the parables talk about was a pearl of great value. And he went and bought the field. Elsewhere, Jesus tells us the field is the world, and he's the one that bought the field with his own life, his own sacrifice, his own blood. But then I turn around and I think, okay, 
what does our sacrifice look like in comparison to the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus made for us? In leaving his throne in glory to purchase you. We can't even wake up 15 minutes early sometimes. One amen. Talking to all of us, I know. Lord, I'm willing to give my life, but don't ask me to wake up 10 minutes early. That's just too much. Lord, I give you all. But wait, not this, and not this, and not this, and not this. Definitely not this. But yeah, everything else, Lord. Well, wait a minute. Am I right? It's the American way. Lord, I'm willing to sacrifice anything. Just don't ask me anything. Or to do anything. Or to give anything. Or to be anything. Because I want to be comfortable. I ask myself this. Bruce, what are you willing to sacrifice to gain the presence of the Lord? There is sacrifice required. Especially those of you who desire to be in ministry, there is sacrifice like you wouldn't believe. You sacrifice yourself, your time. And now everybody's got you connected to the phone. I hate the phone. Sometimes I want to just take it and drown it in a lake. My first pastor, there were no phones. Then they came out with a beeper, and I hated the beeper. Because you couldn't even tell who, you'd just be walking. It's like, oh my gosh, there's some emergency. And then you call, oh, I just want to see how you're doing, Pastor. Oh, thank you, I'm doing fine. (laughs) Just being truthful. Sacrifice. It's hard. It's hard. And we're still in the easy stuff, and it's still hard. So, Lord, how are we going to handle the hard sacrifice when that comes? We have a hard time. I have a hard time handling the easy stuff. What about the hard stuff? What about making a phone call, a friend who's sick or a brother who's sick or a sister who's sick? Just call them, hey, just call them to pray with you, encourage you. A little sacrifice. A little sacrifice. How is his presence described in the New Covenant compared to our definition of his presence? When I see the presence of the Lord in the book of Acts, it doesn't really look like what we call the presence of the Lord in 2021. I mean, I see where they're praying because they've been persecuted for their faith, and the place they're in was physically shaken. Never had that happen. I see where they're walking in the power and presence of the Lord, so much so that some believers come and try to lie to the Holy Spirit, and they die. That sure made a back backdoor revival. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? That was the presence of the Holy Spirit, too. That wasn't the presence we're talking about, but he was still there, real, amen? Maybe that's how church cemeteries got started. I don't know. They took him out by his feet and buried him in the yard. Am I right? The presence. And after that, they were all scared to hang out with the apostles. That's what it says. I bet they were. Two had died. They're like, oh, I'm staying away from them. I want the Lord, but that's a little too real. His presence is transformational, guys. You can't sit in church week after week and not be changed if you're in his presence. You can't be at home praying and reading the Bible week after week, day after day in his presence and not be changed. It's not possible. Luke 4, 18 through 21. This is the biblical presence of the Lord right here. The Spirit of the Lord. Jesus, he's in the synagogue. It's the Torah reading. It's the half Torah reading. And he opens the scroll to the book of Isaiah. 
And he begins to read from the book of Isaiah. And this is what he reads. And it's quoted here in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. How many of you know that you and I are ambassadors of Jesus? Amen? He said the same thing he did, we're going to do too. That's why he's got to go and send his Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And verse 19 goes on, says, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. You can look, it's there though. Dakota. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The presence of the Lord allows us to preach the good news, not just in word, but in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Listen, guys, I want you to hear me really clear. This younger generation has heard enough words from church people. They need to see something authentic and something real. Amen? I'm an old guy, and I want to see something authentic and real. These young people want to see something authentic and real. And so it starts with us allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us. And so it can't just be in word, but in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so real that he manifests himself in supernatural, divine ways to encourage the hearts and the lives of individuals. We need his presence because he wants to use you to bring his presence to someone else. How many of you have ever heard that saying? We say it all the time. Pastor Brian said it. I've said it. Where his hands, where his feet, right? Wherever we go, he goes. So if his presence is on our life, then where we go, his presence is going too. Just like this young man who spent quality time with the Lord came to our prayer meeting from another state, the presence of God came with him. <coughs> Amen? You want the presence of God to be wherever you're at. It doesn't have to be just in a church setting. Do you know the Holy Spirit can give you a word for somebody in the market? Wouldn't it be amazing if a hundred people from Hope for Life, you say, why here? Because this is the only thing I have any control of. I don't even have control over this. This is the only thing I have any ability to speak into is you guys. So a hundred people from here go into HEB and Walmart, and all of a sudden you guys are just walking in the presence of the Lord, prophesying and giving words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and praying for the sick. And they were accurate because you've been in his presence. I don't know what the city would do. <laughs> Tell you what the scripture says. They would say, God is in you of a truth. And they'd fall on their face in repentance. That's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He's writing to the church of Corinth. And he says, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. We don't need more human wisdom. We don't need just a pep talk every Sunday. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. That's what we need. The power and the presence of Holy Spirit. I want the real, amen? But I don't want the real so they can stick me on a 700 club. Forget all the ego pride stuff. And don't think there's not some of that in mixed in with all this. <sighs> Makes me crazy. God does a miracle through somebody and 
Next thing they know, they're calling up 700 clubs, asking to be, man, Jesus said, go and tell nobody. I mean, just so you don't get caught up in that pride and ego thing. Man, if God does a miracle, rejoice. You can tell us about it. We'll rejoice with you. But don't think it was you that did any great thing. What Peter and John say, why do you look at us like we did this miracle to the man at the gate beautiful who was just healed after his whole life being lame and begging for money there? We didn't do this. Jesus, whom you crucified, did this. Bet that went over real big. Jesus, whom you crucified. His spirit has raised this man up and healed him. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about the 21st century version where we've got some special speaker and we've got 200 people being prayed over for. That's wonderful. That's awesome. But it's not about us. So maybe it's 200 people out and about in their daily life operating and moving in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, not afraid of what God wants to do through them. I want to ask you a question. How many of you believe that God can heal sick people? Raise your hand. Leave it up high. Let me see. Okay, y'all look around. Okay? Okay, you can put your hands down. How many of you have prayed with at least two sick people this week? See, if we believe God can do something, then we need to act on that. I want to be a doer of the stuff. Everybody say a doer of the stuff. I love that, amen? Because God has stuff for us to do. So if I really believe God can heal the sick... But then you're like, well, I'm not sure God can do it through me. Well, wait a minute. Is it you healing them or is it him? It's him. Everybody say it's him. So that means if you're willing to step out in faith and pray for somebody in the name of Jesus, man, let God do what he wants to do. And you don't have to get all freaky about it. You just say, hey, brother, do you mind if I pray with you? Pray for you? I was walking through the store and I just saw that you know, you're walking with a limp. Do you mind if I pray over you? And just pray for him in Jesus' name. They get healed? Hallelujah. They don't get healed that second. It's okay. Right? But I'm scared. <laughs> we get over all that fear and all that insecurity, man. God will do so much with us. <clears throat> Nothing to be scared of. <clears throat> scared as you see a dead body and God's going to raise him from the dead. Well, that would be scary. Since like, well, if I pray, nothing happens. <clears throat> the Lord will meet you right where you're at. Amen. Listen, not all of you guys are loud, robust individuals like myself and some of y'all who I won't name, but you know who you are. Some of you are just real meek and quiet, but God can use you just whatever personality you have. This isn't about personality. It's about presence. Everybody say about presence. And his presence is on the meek and quiet as much and sometimes more than it is on us loud mouthy people. Amen? I have to learn to be quiet so the Holy Spirit can move. You're already there. <laughs> the presence of the Lord allows us to heal the brokenhearted by the Holy Spirit. How many of you think it's a lot of brokenhearted? His presence brings lasting transformation and is not just an emotional response, though emotions may be involved. It brings change. His presence brings change. Listen, the biggest prayer for me, for our congregation is when people come in here, they sense the presence of Holy Spirit. Not that we're a picture perfect. You know, listen, my first church, I was young, 
and dumb. I'm allowed to say that because I'm talking about myself. So I was young, young, young and dumb. And I was trying to make a postcard. You ever look at a postcard? Everything's beautiful. I mean, it's picture perfect. Everybody's, you know, all your people, everybody looks perfect. They're all dressed perfect. Everything's just perfect. Listen, we're dealing with sheep. Sheep get dirty and stinky sometimes. Not everything's going to be perfect. Sometimes babies are going to be crying. Kids are going to be making noise. It's okay. Just church, just families, just people. Amen? Man, I'm just glad to hear babies. We ain't have babies for years, praying for babies. God, send us babies. Then babies come there. Oh, they're too loud. Man, who cares? I'll preach them. I'll be louder. Or I'll say, Nate, turn me up, brother. <laughs> I want the real. I'm 56 years old, guys. I'll be 57 in December. I'm not as senior as some of you, but I'm not as young as some of you either. And I can tell you in the last part of my life, I want what's real. My time is precious to me. I want my time left serving the Lord to count. To count. I think about that all the time. I think it would do all of us well to think about that. Because you might have a few more years than me, but in the end, you know what? The only thing that matters is what we've done with the time the Holy Spirit's given us. You see, what's cool about bringing the presence of Holy Spirit is you can bring it anywhere. You don't have to quit your job and get rid of your clothes and go walking off down the road into the sunset to preach the gospel. You work a good job and bring Jesus with you. You can go to Walmart. They need Jesus at Walmart. Go to H-E-B on a Saturday. When it's packed like sardines, you heard a road rage. You ever see road rage when people are driving carts? And they're driving... You cut me off. It's like bumper carts. It's like, dear Lord, brother, I'll get you the beans for you. Just relax. It's good. Life will go on, amen? It's okay. You see, I love Jesus, and I love the fact that his Holy Spirit's in us and with us. I love the fact that his presence will go wherever we go, But we don't realize that or think about it. We're like, man, I sure felt the Holy Spirit in church Sunday morning. And thank God for that. But how about, man, you know, as I was walking down the aisle at HEB, I sure felt the Holy Spirit. And I prayed for somebody that was sick. And I don't know what happened, but I knew I was obedient to the Lord. I like shopping at HEB. Your thing might be Market Street. Well, you get the gist. It's out there. Doing the stuff, right? And you don't have to be like an alien from a UFO. Like you just came from another planet. Bless God, sister! Are you washed in the blood? They're not even a believer. They're like, washed in the blood? And they're like, call 911, psychopath on aisle 18. Man, just talk like a normal person. Right? Talk like a normal person. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. God's not as impressed with that kind of stuff, guys. He's really not. And if you're a King James aficionado, you don't have to pray in these and thous. Right? Just be normal. Everybody say be normal. Look at your neighbor say be normal. Dear Lord, I just hunger for normal Christians that love God, normal people that love Jesus. That's what I'm after, amen? Not people that are like walking around like psychopaths. And don't think there aren't some out there. They think, I call it super spirituality. It's really a cloak for disobedience in their life a lot of times. Uh Uh-oh. Did I say that, brother? 
Almost done. Y'all still with me? Are you getting anything out of this? Now, I'm just talking to you like home folk today, okay? The presence of the Lord brings liberty to the captives. Those who are captive to sin, the Spirit of the Lord can bring freedom. We were talking about this in Sunday school. Believers live in darkness but say that they're walking in the light. You can't live in immorality and live in sin and say you're walking with Jesus. You're not. You're deceiving your own self. I don't care how you cloak it, how you word it, how you justify it. Sin is sin. And the best thing you and I can do is admit, God, this is sin. Forgive me. Rid me of this. Amen. Amen. We live in a culture where we'll never see captives set free if we don't realize people are captives. Matter of fact, I'm going to quit with this part, and I'll just make a note, and I'll just continue again the next time I have an opportunity to speak with part three. But I want to tell you this. Benny and the Jets, come up here. I'll use you as an example, trooper. (laughs) Right here. All right. Now, I don't have a real rope. I wish I did. Because what I would want to do is, I want to I I give you guys a uh, sermon illustration here. Let's say that Ben here is wrapped with chains. Okay, let's say they're spiritual chains. Okay? And their spiritual chains, let's just call it what it is. Let's call it chains of immorality. Okay? And you know what's going on maybe in Ben's life. And let's say that you just don't think he's captive because you think it's okay with God. And so he's walking around in chains. How are you going to bring liberty to the captive if you don't realize he's a captive? If you think it's okay. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, brother. Forget the chains you've got wrapped around your heart and around your life. It's not okay. And the sooner we realize it, then the sooner we can operate in the presence of the Holy Spirit and see those chains removed. You have to realize they're there. Guys, do you realize how many chains people have in their life? Thank you, brother. <clears throat> that was easy task, wasn't it? Just had to stand there, yeah. <laughs> Get a massage, right? <laughs> do you realize how many chains there are in people's lives? Even within our own congregation, there are some of you can't worship, can't lift your hands. Some of you afraid to get with the Holy Spirit. Some of you still doing the this is about me thing. Some of you men probably addicted to pornography. Young people addicted to themselves, addicted to video games. There are chains, and the Holy Spirit wants to break them. It starts with us. You want to see his presence in your life. You've got to be free to give freedom. You've got to have life to give life. Let's all stand to our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we bless you. We love you, Jesus. We honor you, Lord, today. We thank you, Lord God, for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit at work in the hearts, the minds, the lives. Lord, those who are captive to chains, I just felt something click in my heart, Lord, that they're at the end. You're not here to condemn us for those chains. You're here to allow your presence to set us at liberty. That means to make us free. There is freedom in Jesus. Not freedom to do what we want, but freedom to love you and serve you and to obey you, to trust you, to have faith in you, to do things your way, Lord, and not our own way. And it's in doing it your way that we'll find such blessing, such joy, such peace in our life. 
I'm not going to call you forward on this call, but with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here, you don't have to tell me what that chain is, but there's a chain on your life. You lift your hand to Jesus. You be honest before God right now, by golly, and you lift your hand to the Lord. Say, there is a chain on my life. Jesus knows what it is. And you lift your hand and leave it lifted up to the Lord right now, all over the room. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Leave your hand up. I want you to pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, everybody, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, to break these chains off of my life in Jesus' name. 